Right, in this video, we're going to talk to you about how to make graphs of the sine and cosine function. It's a little bit weird, but it's actually pretty easy to do once you get the understanding of it. So the first sine uh, function that we're going to talk about is sine. We're going to talk about y equals sine of x. Now, to understand that we're going to graph this, the first thing I need you to understand is that we're going to graph this in the xy coordinate plane. That is where the x-axis and the y-axis. Like, this is the coordinate plane you guys have been dealing with ever since algebra, right? Probably even before that. Pretty easy. xy coordinate plane. Well, make sure that you understand that those x's are what we call the input values, and the y's are what we call the output values, okay? Now, when we think about the sine function, we need to turn it into a function, which means x's to be our inputs, and we need y's to be our outputs. So our y's are our output, our x's are our input, right? Just like it is when we make the graph. But we need to remember, we need to understand of what is an input value? What do you put into sine? Remember, going into sine is an angle. The input value for sine is an angle theta, right? And what sine does is it allows us to analyze that angle, and it spits out for us the y-coordinate on the unit circle, okay? Because remember, sine is a ratio of the y divided by r, but that y and that r come from the unit circle. And when the unit circle is 1, radius of 1, that's why we just get the y-coordinate from the unit circle. So when we go to make this graph in a moment here, we're going to make sure that our inputs are angles, okay? Which means that the x axis turns into an axis of angles, okay? And those angles are going to be in theta. So we're going to start our x axis at 0 radians, and then we're going to count by pi over 3 radians, pi over 4 radians, pi over 3 radians, pi over 2 radians, and so forth. And you'll see that in a second. And the y-axis is going to represent for us our outputs. But remember, what does sine treat the outputs as? Y-coordinates from the unit circle. Okay, so as long as we keep that in mind, that when we write sine as a function, x is the angle, that's the input, and the y is the y-coordinate from the unit circle. Okay, so let's try to show you here very easily how we're going to make a graph of the function y equals sine of x. So notice on the left here I have my unit circle because I know that the output values come from that unit circle, so we're going to need that. But on the right-hand side here, I have an actual xy coordinate grid. Now, notice the x-axis is in angles, right? Because these are my angles. That's the input. So, every mark represents pi over 6. So, every mark here represents pi over 6. So, here's 1 pi over 6, 2 pi over 6, which we know is pi over 3, 3 pi over 6, which is, of course, pi over 2, 4 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 6 pi over 6, and so forth, okay? So, now, what's going to happen is we're going to find that angle, that's the input, and then we're going to go to our unit circle to get the output. So let's start with zero radians. At zero radians, the y coordinate from the unit circle is zero. So that means I have a point of zero comma zero. That first point there is zero comma zero. I'm actually going to keep track of these points as I go down here. All right, next angle I come to is pi over six. At pi over six, the y coordinate or the height of that value is one half. Okay, so this y axis here, let's do this. Let's have this be one half, and let's have this be one, and this would be one and a half, negative um, one and a half, negative one, negative 1.5, and so forth. Okay, you get the idea. So that means at pi over 6, which remembers this first tick mark here, we are at 1 half. So we're right here at 1 half. Okay? And we're going to continue on. At pi over 4, now, keep in mind, where's pi over 4? Well, technically, pi over 4 is directly in between pi over 6 and pi over 3. So that'd be directly in between. So at pi over 4, my y-coordinate, or again, the height from the unit circle, the height at that value, the y-coordinate, is radical 2 over 2. So if you need to take a second to grab a calculator to figure out what radical 2 over 2 is, go ahead and do so. It's about 0.7. So right here, directly in the middle, pi over 4, we are at about 0.7. So 0.7 is going to be somewhere right around there, a little bit less than 1. Okay, let's continue on at pi over 3. At pi over 3, my y coordinate from the unit circle is radical 3 over 2. Again, if you need to grab your calculator to figure out what radical 3 over 2 is, it's approximately 0.87. So again, somewhere really, really, really close to um, 1, but not at exactly 1. Like really, really, really close, right? 0.86. Okay, and then finally at pi over 2, 
at pi over 2, my y coordinate is 1. So I end up with 1 right here. Okay? And then now what we're going to do is we're going to keep going around the unit circle. So notice how it started. That y value kept getting bigger, right? It started at 0, it grew to 1 half, it grew to radical 2 over 2, it grew to radical 3 over 2, and then finally it grew to 1. Now we're going to continue going here. At 2 pi over 3, it's now starting to shrink. It's back down to radical 3 over 2, about 0.87. At 3 pi over 4, which is going to begin being directly in between right here, at 3 pi over 4, we're shrunking down to radical 2 over 2. So once again, that's at about 0 0.7, somewhere right around there. And then at 5 pi over 6, right here, we have shrunken down back to 1 half. And then finally, so when we get all the way back to pi, our y coordinate from the unit circle is back to zero. So notice we kind of grow, 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 and then we start to shrink, 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 right? Now we're going to continue to keep going at 7 pi over 6. I'm now at negative 1 half. So now I'm dipping down into the negatives. So at 7 pi over 6, I'm down here at negative 1 half right, because that's a negative distance there. Over here at uh, 5 pi over 4, I'm at negative radical 2 over 2, which is about negative 0.7. At 4 pi over 3, I'm at negative radical 3 over 2, which is again about negative 0.86, so somewhere right around here. And then finally at 3 pi over 2, I've dipped all the way down to negative 1. And then now I start to come back out of this bottom hole here. So at 5 pi over 3, I have a y coordinate of negative radical 3 over 2. I get about negative 0.87. And then at uh, 7 pi over 4, I'm at negative radical 2 over 2. And again, that's about negative 0.7. And then finally back to 11 pi over 6, I'm at negative 1 half again. And then when I go all the way around to a full 2 pi, sine value is back to to zero. So what happens is we get this nice, smooth, and again, my picture's not great, but this nice, smooth wave. And that's why a sine function makes what we call a wave, a wave graph here, right? And understand what's happening here is that our inputs are the angles as we go around the unit circle. That's the x-axis. And as we go around the unit circle, our y-coordinates start to grow, and then they cap out at 1, and then they start to shrink. They come back to 0. They continue diving down back to negative 1, and then they go back up. Now remember, we could continue to go around the circle more and more, and if we go around the circle more and more, this exact same pattern here is going to continue. Okay, this same pattern is going to continue. We're going to go back up to 1, back to 0, down to negative 1. And remember, we can even go around a circle backwards, right? We could actually go left going down into the negatives, and that's going to start going down and then back up. So we get this curve that basically just keeps doing this, and it just keeps doing this, and it just keeps doing this. And um, it's not the greatest picture up there that I've ever shown, but you get the basic idea of what's happening with this sine function, okay? So remember, the input... Um, the x is an angle, and you can put anything you want to. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. There's no value that you can't plug in. You can do negative angles, positive angles. The output is always going to be between 1 and negative 1 because the most the y value could ever be on the unit circle is 1, and the smallest it could ever be is negative 1. So we're kind of making a wave back and forth in between there. All right, let's talk about the cosine function now. Now, again, I want to remind you one more time what's happening here. When we're working with the cosine function, we have an x-axis and we have a y-axis, right? That x is an input, okay? One more time, what's the input for cosine? The input is the x value, but what is that, right? That's an angle theta, right? We input angles into cosine, and what do we get out? What is our output? Remember, on the xy coordinate grid, the y is our output. So right here, this y is our output. Now, it's a little bit weird. The output for cosine is the x-coordinate from the unit circle. Okay? Now, we learned that the cosine is the x value from the unit circle divided by the, unit, the, the radius. But remember, when you divide by a radius of 1, because you're on the unit circle, you get just the x-coordinate. And I know that seems really weird, because... In our graph, we're calling that the y value, but we have to understand that it's, it's more of an output value, right? And the output value for cosine is the x-coordinate from the unit circle. But we're calling it y because when we deal with functions, we always deal with x and y. We just have to make sure we understand what that y actually represents with cosine. So once again, I have a unit circle here, and we're going to make a graph of this. That way we can really understand it. And I'm going to use red just so it stands out a little bit. Okay, let's go ahead and start at zero, right? Okay, at zero degrees, 
what is our x coordinate from the unit circle? Oh, it's 1, right? Because now we're talking about the x coordinate, right? We're talking about the horizontal distance here. So we're actually going to start up here at 1. Remember, this was my 0 0.5, and this was 1, so this was negative 0 0.5, and this was negative 1. Okay, so at 0, we're actually start at 1. And then at pi over 6, we're up to, or we drop to, excuse me, about 0.87. So right around here, we kind of drop a little bit. And then at pi over 4, we drop to 0.7. So that's about right here, remember? Radical 2 over 2 is 0.7. At pi over 3, we're at 1 half. So we're now right here at 1 half. And at pi over 2, we drop all the way down to 0. And then now we're again, we're going to start to grow more as we go out. But now we're going in a negative direction. Because remember, we're talking about the x coordinates from the unit circle. So 2 pi over 3, we are now at negative 1 half. There it is right here, at negative 1 half. At 3 pi over 4, we're at about negative 0.7. So somewhere right around here. And at 5 pi over 6, we're going to be at that negative 0.86 value. And then finally at pi, we're all the way down to negative 1. Our x coordinate from the unit circle at pi is negative 1. And then now we start to climb back up. At 7 pi over 6, we're at negative 0.87, about that. And then at uh, 5 pi over 4, we're at negative 0.7. Somewhere right around there, again, just approximating. At 4 pi over 3, we're at negative 1 half. And then at 3 pi over 2, we're back to 0, right here at 0. So we've kind of started up high. We started at 1, and then we started to decline. And then we declined all the way down to 0, and then back to and then down to negative 1. And now we're starting to climb our way back up. So at 5 pi over 3, we're now going back into the pauses. At 5 pi over 3, we're back at positive 1 half again, right here. At 7 pi over 4, we're at radical 3 over 2, which is about um, 0.7, or radical 2 over 2, excuse me. And then at 11 pi over 6, we're at radical 3 over 2, or about positive 0.87. And then at 2 pi, we're all the way back at the beginning where we started, and we have a uh, x coordinate from the unit circle of 1. So we start this nice, smooth curve here, starting at 1, dropping itself down to 0, coming back up. So I'm not doing a very good job connecting my dots. And all the way back to 2 pi. So we get this nice, smooth curve here. Sorry, my curve doesn't look too nice and smooth. And it's interesting because, remember, we can continue to go around the circle. So this curve is going to actually start to repeat itself. And then it's also going to work backwards. I can go left or right. I can go backwards. So again, the, sine cur the cosine curve, excuse me, is it's going to start up here at 1, and it's just going to keep repeating itself up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And then it's even going to go negative. If we go into the negative direction, we're going to go down, then up, down, then up, down, then up. And I'm not drawing the best, smoothest, beautiful curve ever, but you get the idea. Now, like I said, the only thing that tricks students a little bit when we're working with cosine is under oh, I wrote that wrong, uh, cosine of x. Um, understand that the y value, right, what we're calling the y value is actually the output, which is the x coordinate from the unit circle, because that's what cosine does, is it takes in an angle, we're calling that x, right, that's your angle, and the output y is the x coordinate from the unit circle, right? So that's how you graph the sine and cosine functions. Now these two functions are called periodic functions. They're called periodic functions because they repeat themselves, okay? The length it takes for one cycle is called the period length, and the period length for both sine and cosine is one full circle or two pi, right? For sine it's going to do this, it's going to start at 0, 0. It's going to go up to 1, down to negative 1, back to 0. That is one period length for cosine, or for sine, sine, sine. I'm going to write that there, so I remember. That is sine. For cosine, we start up here at negative, or at, at 1, and then we drop down to, ne to, to 0, down to negative 1, back to 0, and then all the way back to 1. So there's one period length for cosine cosine of x, okay? So these ideas is they're called periodic functions because all these things do is they repeat themselves. They're going to keep repeating, and you can even go backwards and keep repeating. Same thing with cosine. It just is going to repeat that pattern and repeat that pattern and repeat that pattern. That's why they're called periodic functions, okay? Now, the only other um, kind of term definition you need to know is the amplitude. So when we're working, for example, for sine, ooh, that's a pretty nice sine curve I just drew right there. The amplitude is the distance from the peak to 
to the x-axis, right? That is your amplitude right there. That distance right there is known as your amplitude. I'll just put AMP for amplitude. And that would be the exact same value if we were to go to the x-axis down to the bottom valley, I guess you could call it. Okay, that is your amplitude. When you're working with cosine, Remember, cosine starts up here at 1, and its period looks like this, roughly like that. Mm, that's not the best drawing I've ever done, but the uh, amplitude is, once again, from the very highest peak all the way down to the x-axis. There's your amplitude, which would also be from the x-axis down to that lowest peak. Again, that is what we call the amplitude of your function. So make sure you understand that these are called periodic functions because they repeat themselves, and they have this wave-like pattern, and the height of that wave is what we call the amplitude. So hopefully you're able to understand everything in this, in this um, video here for how to graph these functions. It is kind of interesting. The first thing that you really kind of have to get past is the understanding of the x is the input and angle, y is the output. For sine, that's the y coordinate from the unit circle. For cosine, the output is the x coordinate from the unit circle. And once you understand that, it becomes pretty easy to make graphs of these. All right, that's it. We'll talk more about some other graphs and transforming graphs in the next video.